Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Inane Dragon, and tonight we're looking at a video that many, many, many people have already addressed, which is entirely intentional on my part. It's part of my point that at least ten other atheists have responded to this video before I touched it. We're looking at Stephanie Thomason's 11 questions atheists cannot answer making this at least the 11th time that an atheist has, in fact, answered her questions. Hello, you've reached ChristianApologist.com, and I'm S.J. Thomason, and today I'm going to present to you 11 questions that atheists cannot answer. As I've said, many atheists have answered these questions, thus proving Stephanie wrong. Worse still, she knew answers to all of these questions already exist. She's attempted to refute them on her blog in the past. So, I have to ask, and this is directed at Stephanie directly. When did Jesus say you should lie when presenting apologetics on his behalf? Isn't that a sin? Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, there are entire books written addressing many of the topics Stephanie treats as unanswerable by atheists. And these books were, if it weren't already clear, written by atheists. Some questions I'll be glossing over here, other than to point to decent sources for quick answers. When they come up, I'll explain why I'm giving them short shrift. The first question, how do you explain why the early Christian martyrs preached for decades saying they saw the risen Christ? Two, how do you explain the rise of Christianity to between 5 and 6 million by 313 when it was finally legalized from such humble roots? I'm not really going to address these here because they're at least an entire video in their own right. However, the Godless Wolf provides a decent crib notes version of why these questions are easy to answer. However, I do want to point out that these questions are poorly asked in the first place. Stephanie, you're assuming an absolutely uncritical reading of the Acts and Gospels. We have strong reason to read these books critically, as they are explicitly propaganda pieces, not objective historical documents. Worse, you fail to explain that you are really asking why Christianity grew in the face of constant persecution prior to 313. And this is such a bad thing, because you not only try to hide this aspect of the question so you can gotcha people who don't address it directly, but because Christianity demonstrably wasn't facing constant persecution prior to 313. Before the mid-third century, persecution was sporadic and entirely localized, to the point that Pliny the Younger had no idea what to do with Christians, and the emperor could think of no precedent upon which he should rely. And this happened after Nero's persecution of Christians in the city of Rome. Even after the first imperial decrees against Christianity, enforcement of these decrees was sporadic and inconsistent. The fact is that while oppression did happen and martyrs were made, it was nowhere near so severe as to impede the growth of the first evangelical religion that demanded allegiance to their specific god alone. For an authoritative read on this era of Christian history, I recommend people read Bart Ehrman's The Triumph of Christianity. Bart, by the way, is an atheist who answered questions one and two with academic rigor and thorough research before Stephanie made this video. And she knows it. So you've lied, Stephanie. You already knew these questions had been answered. You merely reject those answers because you uncritically accept the Gospel accounts and the Book of Acts. Three, what powered inflation of the universe? There are many good hypotheses addressing this topic. However, I'm going to gloss over this because I want to get on Stephanie's case about something she's clearly uncomfortable with. What is wrong with admitting ignorance, Stephanie? Why is I don't know such a frightening phrase to you that you laughed and accused Matt Dillahunty of distancing himself from the Chariots of Fire wiki over the use of the phrase, I don't know? Honestly, other than asserting God did it, you cannot answer this question any better than, say, atheist cosmologist Sean Carroll. And asserting God did it when it is more accurate to admit ignorance is fallacious reasoning, commonly referred to as the God of the gaps. You don't want to cram your God into a gap because we will eventually close it on your God and he will be forced to pop out as a result. 4. Why are humans spiritual? It depends entirely on what you mean by spiritual. 
But because genetic and cultural coevolution for cooperation, coupled with a predisposition to recognize intent behind any change in the environment, favors belief in supernatural entities and powers of various forms, we expect humans to believe in gods and form religions around those uh, supernatural powers. At least, that's the best answer we have courtesy of atheists John Haidt and E.O. Wilson as they explain in their books The Righteous Mind and Darwin's Cathedral, respectively. There are many other answers, and almost all of them make more sense if there is no god than if there is a god. Only confirmation bias and your desire for there to be a god allows you to pretend that these answers aren't out there and aren't credible, because I know you are aware of the answers. Again, we find you to be lying right out of the gate, Stephanie. You knew these questions could be answered trivially. Is it any surprise that I'm the 11th person to answer your questions? 5. Where did consciousness come from? Current best answer, consciousness as we commonly use the term, is an emergent property of the innumerable interactions of the neurons of your brain. Again, this is a case where you're cramming your god into gaps in our scientific knowledge, gaps that may well be closed in the future. And again, this is a case where we know people have answered this question before with alacrity and you just don't like their answers. In this case, it's Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett in more than a few different books. Now, I'll grant that what I've read of both leaves me unsatisfied, but it doesn't make their answers necessarily wrong, just perhaps incomplete. Or maybe I want consciousness to do too much work and I'm wrong in my expectations. As a running theme, that seems to be the trap that you fall into yourself, Stephanie. Beyond the musings of Harris and Dennett, there are a number of research programs into consciousness, and I'll link a few of them in the description below. Not one of them has come to the conclusion, therefore God, or even, therefore souls. Or for some of you, even, therefore idealism instead of materialism. Six. How do you explain what some have called our sixth sense? Another example of a poorly worded question. Our sixth sense technically is what psychologists call proprioception. It's our awareness of our bodily position, even in absence of feedback, from the other five senses. Proprioception is what enables you to touch a body part that you can't see. For example, close your eyes and touch your nose with your right hand. How'd you manage to do that? Because proprioception enables you to recognize the relative locations of your right hand and your nose, as well as the movement necessary to lead the one to the other. Of course, we're all well aware that this isn't what you meant by a sixth sense. You want to fantasize about ESP, out-of-body experiences, and so much more. Well, some of this arises from subconscious awareness, as several of your respondents have already pointed out and as you already knew. And some of it is just made up bullshit that has been repeatedly debunked by the likes of James Randi or Penn and Teller's bullshit television series. Sorry, Stephanie, but a basic understanding of the world would demonstrate that atheists don't need to explain supernatural powers. You have to show us that they actually exist. 7. How did the Earth overcome what MIT and Stanford physicists call statistically miraculous odds to have habitable conditions? This is the question that made me want to respond to this video, because here you're either wildly misinformed about what's going on, quote mining like the devil, or both. For example, when you say MIT and Stanford physicists, you should really be saying is an MIT physicist and two Stanford's physicists. Because the physics departments generally at either MIT or Stanford do not say this at all. Furthermore, you're misrepresenting their paper. When they discuss how our universe had to overcome near-miraculous odds to exist and allow us to live within it, they are presupposing just one of several cosmologies that are currently under examination. Worse for you, the cosmology that they're examining asserts that all possible universes will necessarily exist at some point in time, including ours. In other words, while the odds are near miraculous that our universe would exist if there were only one universe, their own model that creates these odds also assumes that all possible universes, including ours, must exist. So it is, in effect, an argument against your position, not for it. Eight, why does humanity cherish humility and honesty over pride and deceit? Nine, why do almost all feel compelled to do what's right by helping neighbors? Why is there a norm of reciprocity? Since you have, to all intents and purposes, asked the same question twice to pad your resume, I'll group them together for you. 
This is one where absolutely every single atheist who have answered this video has done well enough that there is no point in me responding again. Viewers could pretty much choose any of the videos in the playlist and get a solid comprehensive explanation of this. Or if you want a more academic take on it, check out The Red Queen by Matt Ridley, The Evolution of God by Robert Wright, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, The Moral Landscape by Sam Harris, Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, and The Righteous Mind by John Haidt. All of these, and hundreds more, offer up answers, explanations, and in-depth discussions about the origin and nature of human morality. Some blend of many of these ideas is likely going to eventually emerge as the consensus position of psychology and biology in offering a comprehensive explanation of why we have morals and why we can be moral even without a god glaring down at us from our imaginations. That you ignore all of this in choosing to claim atheists can't answer your questions, Stephanie, makes you incredibly dishonest. You have either never done any research on your own, or willfully ignore everything that disagrees with your personal viewpoint. 10. What is our greater purpose? We as a collective have no greater purpose, and how wonderful is that? If some celestial dictator told you the meaning of your life, you'd be nothing more than a puppet on a string. As a free agent in the world, bound only by the limits of physics, chemistry, and biology, you can shape your own purpose. The notion of a greater purpose is toxic. It's this utopian ideal of a collective goal or purpose that is the parent of fascism, communism, and every theocratic dictatorship we have ever seen. Fuck that. I'd much rather we remain free to decide our own route through life, and in actual practice, so do you. How can I read your mind like that? Simple. I've never once seen you advocate for executing every person who doesn't live the life you think God demands of them. You are not a radical sociopath. You recognize the value of plurality at its core, even if you try to deny it by pushing your narrow Christian morals onto others, by advocating against legal marijuana, the morality of non-traditional relationships, and all the rest. None of it are you willing to impose with the death penalty. Good on you. You are better than your religion. And eleven... Why is there evil in the world? Because there is no God. Evil is our word. It describes things that harm humans and nature, at least on those occasions when we value nature. Evil is the label we put on all of the shit that your God would personally be responsible for if he actually existed that never should have happened if there were an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, dictator in the sky. Natural evils like Katrina, the volcanic eruption in Hawaii, the tsunamis that ravage the Philippines, blights and droughts in already starving Africa, cancer. All of these are things for which your god would be to blame. Evil makes perfect sense if there is no loving god. But theodicy only works by neutering god. There are an infinite number of ways God could have stopped Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, and the Un family if he existed, and all without violating their free will or anyone else's. Because he's God, with all logically pow possible power at his fingertips. So their existence is proof that your loving God doesn't exist. How dare you try to flip this question around when your God is supposed to care about our world? His absence in opposing evil is proof that Jesus is a lie. Don't try to give us this pathetic crap about it being part of God's plan or he works in mysterious ways. Horseshit! No loving God needs to give children or animals cancer in order to work his will, and your own Bible has God asserting that humans have the same understanding of good and evil that he does in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. To say I can't judge your God is to spit in his own face. So, the obvious answer is, evil exists because we live in a universe lacking any benevolent, powerful entities that transcend time and space. This is part of why I'm an atheist, and makes me wonder just what you were smoking to include this as your 11th question. Really, it's your 9th, since questions 1 and 2, as well as questions 8 and 9, are basically the same damn question as one another. And, as with every other position and question, you sit there smugly pretending atheists can't answer this, even when this particular case was first formulated before the New Testament was written. You cannot be ignorant of these answers and therefore must be dishonest. Stephanie, get real. Become a servant of truth instead of a musty book. Even if it still leads you to a god, I'd at least be able to respect you.
I'm a name dragon, and if you've enjoyed this inanity, consider subscribing for more of the same. Take a minute to comment and vote on the video, your thoughts are interesting to me. Also, those of you foolishly wanting to part with their money, please consider joining my patrons. At this rate, I genuinely don't deserve their support, but they have my eternal thanks anyways. As do you for listening this long. Thank you all, and have a good night.